recommend that despite however much Zoom fatigue some, maybe all of us are feeling, uh, it is allowing conversations to take place that might not otherwise and provides an easy way of recording them. And so I'm just delighted to have this opportunity to talk with uh, two other scholars who have written books about uh, women in early Christianity and have a conversation about our different books, what makes them different, what were the points of intersection, uh, see if we can get each other to argue about things we disagree with and uh, just have some fun talking about some of those interesting details. So since I've started off, let me say I'm James McGrath. I'm uh, the Clarence L. Goodwin Chair of New Testament Language and Literature at Butler University. And uh, my recent book on this topic that we're gonna be talking about today is What Jesus Learned from Women. Who'd like to go next? Oh yeah, great, I'll go. Uh, thanks, James. Yes, I've really uh, enjoyed the fact that we just linked up to some Facebook message i think and um that you had this idea to get us all together and i thought it was a great idea so uh we've managed to do it which is is really good i think in our busy schedules <laughs> we met this time so i'm lucy papiat and i'm here to talk with james and jamie about my book um rediscovering scriptures vision for women and um, as you can probably hear, I'm British and I'm currently in Bristol in the UK. I'm the principal of Westminster Theological Centre, which is a theological college here in the UK. And I teach um, systematics and also a class in spiritual formation. Great. And I'm Jamie Clark Souls, and I am professor of New Testament at Perkins School of Theology in Dallas, Texas a part of Southern Methodist University, and I'm also the founding director of the Baptist House of Studies at Perkins School of Theology, and I'm ordained uh, American Baptist in the American Baptist tradition, and I too am delighted to be here with colleagues and grateful to James for organizing us, like kind of like herding cats, um, and I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, reading and learning from both of your books. I am the author of the book Women in the Bible in the Interpretation Commentary Series Supplemental Volumes, so it's great to be here. Yeah, and we, we don't need to tell everybody how many times we postponed this and had to reschedule, <laughs> but uh, I'm really glad that it's it's come about. Um, we're all, I think, teaching in, in rather different contexts, uh, have different uh, cultural settings and uh, religious versus non-religious affiliations of the places that we might be teaching. Uh, but all of us are approaching this subject, I think, as Christians, I uh, certainly, enjoyed getting feedback on the, the book I wrote uh, for my adult Sunday school class. Uh, always try to remember to add adult, lest, uh, because in some parts of the world, uh, adult Sunday school is not really a thing. And so uh, requires some explanation that I wasn't talking to little children about this. Not that they wouldn't perhaps have provided really excellent and uh, brutally <laughs> honest feedback. Yeah, that's right. um, but presumably, uh, since we're approaching this as Christians, uh, we should start with Jesus. Uh, it seems like a good approach. So I think, yeah, one of the things that I, I know came up in our conversation was uh, really just how to best uh, yeah, tackle the subject of you know, Jesus and women. You know, one can work through the different gospels and try to do justice and focus on what each one has to say as a source or one can focus on uh, trying to get back to the historical Jesus. And of course, there are a variety of different ways of going about that. Uh, yeah, Jamie, your, your book is you know, one I just was so excited about because I, I don't know that, you know, you don't go into everything in as much detail as theoretically one could, but you seem to touch on just about every topic I could think of, as well as the number that <laughs> might not have occurred to me uh, had you not done so. Uh, maybe I should ask, what did you, did you, did you feel that you had to leave anything out in order to get the book down to a certain size or, um, yeah, sure. So it took 10 years to write this book and, uh, really what took the most time was that I just went round and round on the scope of the book. So one, one, uh, commonality between my book and Lucy's is that they aren't confined to the new Testament. Lucy has, 
uh, goes all the way back to creation uh, because of the focus of her her book addressing uh, uh, this, her subtitle, of course, is Fresh Perspectives on Disputed Text. So, so uh, working us through from creation into the New Testament. So yeah, scope was a really big issue. I mean, obviously, as you said, it, uh, we're Christians and, uh, and this is in the interpretation series that's aimed at preachers and uh, Sunday school teachers. And, and uh, so focusing and giving people material on Jesus is naturally kind of central. And I'm a New Testament scholar. So in the introduction, I kind of don't apologize for the fact that the bulk of the, the biggest chapter is on Jesus. But as you know, even within limiting to Jesus and women, there's more than you would expect. There's the, the material in there that you don't expect that we haven't really um, been shining a light on. Um, so even within there, you know, which women, what about them? And what about their interaction with Jesus? Because I love one of the things I love about your book is you're very careful to talk about why you say what Jesus learned from women and not just what women taught Jesus. I mean, you use the widow's might as an example. I mean, she doesn't even know Jesus is watching her. Um, so he learns from, she's not necessarily actively teaching. And that models, you model well the, the notion of listening um, and looking for reading in a different way that helps you notice things that are actually there. Lucy does the same thing. It's not that these things aren't there. It's whether anyone has lifted them up or in some cases more scandalously intentionally suppressed, dismissed, you know, don't look over there, uh, you know, for material that's there. So I think all three of us had to think about scope. Why did we pick the things we picked and why did we leave out other things that we could have talked about? Mm. So I'd love to hear how you all did that. I mean, how did you decide to be kind of focused? Yes, I, I, one of the things that struck me as a sort of commonality between us all is that I think that we were quite focused on people in church who, you know, are living out a Christian life somewhere and probably haven't had, like you were saying, Jamie, had the kind of spotlight shone for them on the the evidence or this kind of data in the scriptures that we have about women um but that has either not been talked about or preached about or written about very much um and we did the work of kind of uncovering um as well as i i think the thing that i i loved your um point jamie about analogical imagination you know, that women, and I, I felt that when I was doing my work, and it's interesting having you, James, here, as a man writing from a woman's perspective, um, very much like a sort of novelist or something, um, mm -hmm. that we, uh, I feel we were all inhabiting our, our imagination drawn from the text. But what I realised when I was doing my work, and I'm sure, Jamie, you would feel the same, is that for years we've read male scholars who have exercised their imagination about, you know, so no one's immune to kind of going, oh, I imagine it was like this, this was the scenario. And in in and we're just doing that from a different perspective. And James, I guess you're doing it in the most creative way, right. um, which I found really fascinating and generative. And, you know, so that was some of the things I think we have in common. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I mean, it's very encouraging. Um, it, it was really interesting, you know, uh, as, as, as a man working on this, as a male scholar, just finding that, you know, on the one hand, I was forced to reflect a lot on, you know, myself learning from women, you know, as I'm talking about Jesus learning from women. And as I'm thinking about ancient sources, neglecting sort of the stories of women and their perspective and their voices, and then reading lots of things by male scholars who had overlooked, ignored, uh, not paid attention to things that I found female scholars talking about in some of these uh, some of these cases in relation to some of these texts. And so uh, they weren't exactly encouraging um, connections between the ancient and the modern. Uh, oftentimes, it was quite disheartening that uh, in some ways we still seem to be tackling and wrestling with some of the same issues. 
Uh, but on the other hand, it, it made for all these resonances. And so uh, I, I, I don't think I could have kept my imagination out of it, even if I tried. And that's, I think, one of the convictions I gained working on this is that uh, our, our imagination is part of investigating history, right? We're not content just to look at little fragments of a, a much larger puzzle and say, well, we've got that one there, this one here, and who knows what was between them, right? We try to imagine the connections between them. Um, wh whether I went too far in some of my imagination or not, um, it was, I knew there was a risk there. <laughs> Yeah, I love that's one thing I really love. I, I was kind of curious, I actually made a note this morning to ask you. So did you have any models in mind um, when you when you chose? So I guess we should say what we keep talking about, James's creativity. So maybe you should speak to it yourself. But the way you first of all, I love your intro chapter. It's so clear. And when if you're using this book for teaching in Sunday school or church, it's so clear. I love that you have subheadings on topics like truth, fiction and storytelling patriarchy, ancient education, ancient economy. Uh, just It's this, a fantastic blend of the historical, so the world behind the text, here's facts you need to know about the first century, whether you like them or not, we can talk about whether they're helpful or unhelpful, but this is how it is for them, the stuff we do know. And then taking it and you start each chapter with this creative, it's, it's italicized and with storytelling. I mean, you storytell, you, I love that you also give names to characters or suggest, you know, names, if, if not the character themselves, maybe the person like in the Samaritan woman, or was it the Syrophoenician woman, where you, you talk about Deborah, my friend, it was the Syrophoenician woman, where you talk about Deborah told me about this guy, it really brings it to life, which I think is inviting a to people who aren't familiar with scripture, and b with those who you could say if there's such a thing as overly familiar with scripture, to kind of um, I don't know, reinvigorate it and freshen up and say, they, these were stories and these, uh, so we're talking about that with the creativity. So you start each chapter with that imaginative scene that draws the reader in, and then you do historical exegesis um, and, um, and other things, but it made me wonder, so did you read, uh, did you, either of you read As a Driven Leaf by Milton Steinberg? So he kind of does this same thing, a kind of historical fiction from a, a rabbi of our period, the first century. Um, and then Bruce Fisk, that book, the Hitch Hitchhiker's Guide to Jesus. Do you know that one? And I was wondering if you, you know, basically I was wondering how you got the idea for the form that yours took. Yeah, uh, so it started out uh, really one, uh, finding that this was the last book hopefully that I will ever approach trying to write it for every possible reader uh, and hoping that everyone can get something out of it. Okay. Uh, but wanting it to be relevant to churches, but also knowing that if I'm going to uh, try to do what I want to do in this book, then I need to make some of these historical arguments that uh, scholars are interested in. And uh, sometimes other people are not. Right? And so it, it did begin as an effort to bridge the gap between the scholarly discussion, say, okay, well, this is a different way of packaging it, uh, of sort of communicating it. But in the process, I regularly found that as I tried to imagine the story unfolding, either it challenged my reconstruction, because I said, I can't picture this conversation happening like this, I must be missing something. Or it led me to ask, new questions. And that was the thing that was most trans, you know, this, I think this, this probably is the book that I've worked on that was most sort of personally transformative and I felt was really challenging me in, in, and stretching me in positive ways. Because when you don't ask the kinds of questions that feminist scholarship asks, you don't ask about women's perspectives, influences, roles in these stories, there are all kinds of things that you, you just never think to ask. Um, and it's, it, it, I was thinking of this as you were talking about both the, mentioning the Syrophoenician woman story and also our over familiarity sometimes with the text. Until I asked some of the some of the questions that this book led me to ask, I had never asked. So how does this woman know Jesus is there when he's trying to keep a low profile? Whose house is he in? Right, and mm. then thinking about the relationships, thinking about you know Jesus staying with someone who probably has some connection, however distant, with where he comes from but then probably also has a connection with this woman, right? So there's a way that people find things out. And 
those are the kinds of things that, you know, on the one hand, we don't have clear evidence, right? The stories don't tell us, here's how this one found out. But on the other hand, we're given enough information that these are natural things to deduce about it. And was thinking about those details as a result of, of, of either trying to narrate the story or asking, you know, about the, the, the main female characters in these stories' perspectives on things. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I loved it. And, and Lucy, I'm curious, a question I had about your, which I absolutely loved your book, and it is going to help me in the spring when I teach, um, especially when I teach the Timothy text. So, I mean, obviously you go from creation and you're, I mean, I guess you should state for the audience what your main, I love your, th I, I just feel like reading page two to them, you know, you, you just articulate perfectly what your book is about succinctly. First of all, I want to show people this is really a great intro paragraph <laughs> to your paper. It's very clear. Um, but we should have you say, you know, what what uh, your book is trying to do. But um, I was one question I had is why now? So mm -hmm. and it, if you could talk about, you know, why did you pick now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to exactly. take your time to do this, right? Yeah. For some reason, because you could have written this five years ago. Um, and also, yeah. I would love for you to just give the audience the gist of the um, Ephesus context. Mm -hmm. That was brand new to me, um, and I love it. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I, so I, I actually feel I got kind of hijacked into writing about women in one sense. It wasn't, I, 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 well, I was trained as a systematic theologian and have written on Christ and the spirit and kind of imagined that that's where I would go as a, you know, as a theologian. And then, um, but actually got extremely troubled first by 1 Corinthians 11 and then sort of sucked into that. And as I got sucked in, I realized that the whole conversation about women and the, the Bible and Paul, really, this is James, you were saying, oh, let's talk about Paul. <laughs> We'd love to talk about Paul. I, because I actually loved Paul as a, a, you know, as an adult Christian and had, hadn't been brought up as an evangelical. So didn't, didn't see him through those lenses and then ended up teaching lots of mainly evangelicals and realizing that this was a huge issue in the evangelical church is how what people think Paul is saying to women and about women. And, and as I got more and more drawn into this subject, I thought we really, sadly, we need to keep um, speaking about this and reiterating if we if we're people who believe that Paul was pro-women and that he followed in Jesus's footsteps you know we started with Jesus and I love that and I think all of us feel you know we read the gospels and we look at the radical nature of Jesus's involvement with women and we believe that and then so we see Paul as one of his most devoted disciples and someone who did walk in his footsteps and we think well why would he have done it any differently and then I I love what you bring out Jamie about the you know just the number of women that Paul which I it, I've read so much about you know the number of women that Paul worked with and who supported him and who he was clearly great friends with and he they were discipling people, they were planting churches, they were leading churches. Anyway, so it was all that backdrop that made me think. And then I realized um, I didn't particularly want to write about it, if you are, if you're to me. And I, I kind of feel like, oh, could we just, isn't the conversation, can we move on? You know, I think a lot of us feel that, a lot of women feel that. Um, could we move on to do the things that we're really passionate about? Mm -hmm. um, but I was persuaded by a number of people that the conversation is still needed. And us meeting today is a kind of, you know, it proves that, that the conversation's ongoing. And I'd love to get, get to a point where it isn't needed. Um, and uh, so why now? Because it still needs to be done. And why a biblical book? Because I see that the the squabbles are over the text. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel that we 
even if we don't really want to, I think we need to go to the text and say, what is the text saying to us? And might we be able to be to read it from a different perspective? And that's what I did in rediscovering scripture's vision. Yeah, and, and same thing I got. The reason I wrote a book on women in the Bible is because Westminster John Knox asked me to write a book on women in the Bible because they're doing a, a number, they've chosen a number of topics. And so like you said, wow, um, for that to all the topics in the world that you can pick, there's one on miracles, one on wealth. It's really interesting, like you said, still, you know, one of the topics that is deserving of a whole volume still is women in the Bible. And in my introduction, you know, I mean, at first I was quite, kind of reluctant because the notion of women in the Bible, there's a danger of saying, first of all, when you talk about women in the Bible, it marks them as special or unusual, yeah. right? Yeah. And it also gives this impression that um, that they're not related. You know, I guess I'm more comfortable these days talking about gender in the Bible to some degree, right? Of which women is a subcategory. Um, what does it also do for, you know, helping us not be in binary categories? So, so anyway, I problematized just the topic at first before I said, okay, now I'm going to do this, but, but here are my kind of, my kind of questions about that. But I have in my email box this morning that I haven't had time to respond to because I was preparing for our conversation, right? I have a fantastic seminary student. So I teach in a seminary context, so training people for ministry. And uh, she's uh, she's amazing. She's doing her internship. She's an amazing leader. And the email in my box, I won't say her name, is, um, is a, uh, wanting to meet about discernment because she's doing in her internship in a wonderful church that affirms women treats them equally, but she's going to graduate in May. And practically speaking, in terms of her actually getting a call to a church, because she is in a, a, a more evangelical, well, my own tradition, Baptist. And so we're quite varied. Baptists are quite varied. But getting a job as a pastor in a Baptist church, there's the majority of those churches would not be open um, to a female pastor and she's one of our best and brightest so and this is 2021 so I'm with you Lucy you kind of hope this becomes an, but I have to be you know inspiring because the texts are inspiring oh, right totally. and we have the Holy Spirit so we know the winds of change right we know where this is headed and right and we've gotten on board with the Holy Spirit but having the patience to kind of continue in the conversation and help people remain hopeful. And also, as you said, people for whom scripture is authoritative. So if you're in the evangelical tradition, means scripture is central. So you're not going to sell anybody who's in that tradition, including me, on something that doesn't have scripture and the interpretation of scripture at its center. Um, so what you're, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, Jamie, about the your use or your reference to the lectionary, which I found yeah. interesting. So, um, so you, well, you would probably explain it better, but it's quite a central theme, isn't it, in your book? It is um, about so your your writing towards a kind of assumption about preaching and and making these things known, which I found really interesting and really great and I just wondered what advice you would have for churches that don't use the lectionary of which there are many in this, especially in the kind of lower you know non-denominational right that's my church or the free church tradition I mean I happen to go to a church that does use lectionary but you're right all people in the free church tradition don't and in some ways right I think we could all argue there are pros and cons to that right to the lectionary um, so those in the free church tradition in a way, shall I say, have no excuse because the whole Bible is in front of you. And so the invitation to become educated by reading works like what you and James uh, have both written, you've got free reign. So educate yourself, read womanist scholars, see what's out there, what's fresh, and then, then preach on it and teach on it in Sunday school and Wednesday night Bible study and, and all of that. Um, so, you know, there's a certain freedom for those traditions, but it involves proactively educating yourself, right? And reading the resources. The resources are now there. Everybody's doing hard work, like the two of you. It's just a matter of, of intentionally choosing to educate yourself. Um, and then, 
you have the tools to, to turn around and teach this stuff. The hard work, like you said, Lucy, has been done for you. You don't have to go dig up the data. You just have to figure out how to present it uh, creatively and invite people in. And then those in the lectionary tradition really have to educate themselves on the, uh, the gifts, but also the problems of the lectionary and how, if you're gonna preach from the lectionary, you're going to exclude a lot of material about women and the material that gets included perpetuates certain stereotypes that are not helpful and that promote kind of the patriarchal structures that both of you, I thought that was interesting. All three of us address patriarchy and the ways that it's problematic, not I mean, problematic in our own time since we're Christian. Okay, fine, it's the first century, that's how it is. But the ways that we still uh, perpetuate some of the uh, big problems of patriarchy. I thought that was interesting that we all um, talked about that. You know, there's certain stories, James, I thought it was interesting. We both really talked a lot about the Samaritan woman. Um, we both spent a lot of time on the Syrophoenician or Canaanite woman. I was interested that you, I was very curious, this is kind of a methodology question for you, James. So there are times in, in your approach that you freely jump between texts, right? So, um, so we were talking about the Samaritan woman and the, the husbands, and she's not a prostitute, right? She doesn't have customers, she has husbands. You talk about serial widow, widowhood. Um, but then you, you'll, you know, adduce the scripture of Jesus talking about no marriage in heaven, you know, whereas normally as New Testament scholars, we're like, we're in the gospel of John, don't go outside of it. And then I was also curious, you title your chapter on the um, Syrophoenician woman, but then you have questions that kind of, um, I would say, blend her being Syrophoenician and Canaanite. And I was super curious about that choice to blend. Yeah, well, I'll start, I'll start with the, the latter. I mean, the one where I really wrestled with whether to blend or to uh, separate uh, was Luke's sort of sinful woman, right? At, who um, in the house yeah. of Mercy is that a variant of sort of the story that it, you know in another gospel of Mary of Bethany and it's a different setting and it that's one of the challenges I wrestled with yeah. and I decided on the one hand that I very much wanted this to be asking about the historical Jesus so recognizing that sometimes uh, the, you know, the the events in the life of Jesus are things that we glimpse through a window that's provided by more than one source, right? Uh, and doing that and seeing that sometimes there were connections between those. Uh, I mean, one of the things that really made me think that maybe I was onto something uh, in terms of the theme of the book was that this seemed to pop up in different places. Um, despite the fact that none of the gospels is really emphasizing Jesus learned from women, Right. Uh, except maybe Luke, in as much as he presents Mary with the Magnificat and then presents Jesus' teaching as, as similar and emphasizes that you know, he grew in wisdom. And so uh, there's there's something of that there, but it seems to come through in more than one place. Um, but it, it does seem to me, you know, I've become, I've gone from being uh, naive uh, and in treating the Gospels as you know, straightforward accounts of things, as one sometimes does if one comes through a conservative uh, religious context, to realizing problems with that and having that challenge so that I sort of my pendulum swung to the other extreme of being, you know, sort of extremely skeptical and, you know, well, I'll, I'll believe it if I can find enough evidence to persuade me, to going back to somewhere in between and recognizing that, you know, the even stories that we may not be able to pin down precisely, you know, this is exactly how it happened. This is, you know, tell us what these, you know, the impression that Jesus had, right, within decades of, you know, when he was doing these things. And so there are, there are stories that emerge about historical people very early on, which are, you know, fabricated or aggrandized or things like that. And yet, reflect the kind of impression people had of that person. Mm -hmm. right. And so trying to get beyond the, the, the sort of atomistic approach to history and allowing uh, myself the, the room to trace ripples. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's kind of like what you did with it. I loved your George Washington and the cherry tree. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the examples when you give that's so helpful, you know, as a teaching as a teaching tool, you know, the, yeah, yeah. And Lucy, but I want to make sure because I am so I love the, F, the Ephesus Artemis thing. Oh, yeah, I really, to... really want to make sure the audience um, gets their curiosity peak. So they this book is amazing for lots of reasons, especially in terms of 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 you showing that scripture. It's not kind of playing loose and free with scripture to see it as promoting the flourishing of all creation, um, all genders. It's in there. We're not making stuff up. We're trying to kind of uh, do that. Um, so I love the whole thing, but that Ephesus Artemis thing kind of rocked my world. So could you, <laughs> you mind kind of summarizing that insight for the- No, listeners? I don't mind at all. I, I, I took the insights from uh, different people who I sort of blended together. So um, as many people will know, the Kroger's um, actually suggested a number of years ago that 1 Timothy 2 about women, about Paul telling Timothy um, that a woman really, you know, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over men, um, that this was referring to something very context specific and they suggested that as Ephesus was a center for Artemis or Diana, um, as we know that there was this huge cult there, uh, that there was some problem with the women in the women who had been converted and come into the church, that they were still had kind of one foot back in the cult and that they had received certain strange teaching from the cult, which had then distorted their Christian um, doctrine. And that, that um, and there were various sort of people putting pieces of the puzzle together about whether Paul was actually instructing Timothy to teach those women properly about Christianity before he let them, they got let loose as teachers in the church. Um, we, and, and as I come, came across these ideas, I thought that makes a lot of sense to me. And then I started digging a bit further into who else has explored this idea. And the two people I draw on are Gary Hogue and Sandra Glan. And both of them take a slightly different perspective. So they, bo they both um, work with this idea that actually what Paul was doing was addressing a problem within the church of women who were coming out of the Artemis cult and that their views of God and women were, were corrupting their doctrine. And but the thing I found really fascinating was that what, um, so Gary Hogue does it through a word study of um, 1 Timothy in, in relation to a novel that he um, finds. Well, he, he knew, if people knew about the novel, but it was redated to be contemporaneous with the letter, which was all very exciting because it was written in about Ephesus and about the cult um, uh, and by a man called Xenophon. And um, so he does a, a, a close word study of these two texts saying, look, all these words that are associated with the, with the Artemis cult appear here in the text of 1 Timothy. And so I think he says, I think Paul is addressing these women kind of dressing like Artemis and coming into the church and being very vocal and very forceful and teaching the wrong thing. And then Sandra Glan brings out very specific things about Artemis, which I found fascinating and actually have been, they're, they're um, substantiated through inscriptions that are found from that era to Artemis, that she was, essentially she was the kind of um, goddess of childbearing. And um, I'll cut the very long story short, but if you were pregnant um, at the time in Ephesus and you weren't Christian, she would be the God that, that, that you would go to for protection. And if something went wrong in it was assumed in a in a through in childbearing or childbirth, um, she was able to dispatch you so she could, um, she was a, a, a hunter as well and she had a bow and arrow and she could um, enact a mercy killing so that you wouldn't actually go into a long protracted labour where you and your baby would both die in the end. 
Um, and so obviously you wanted to go to Artemis for protection in childbearing. And um, that was fascinating to me because the one verse that we have no idea what it means, <laughs> so you will be saved through childbearing or uh, yeah. suddenly I thought, wow. So through the process of bearing your children as a Christian woman, you will be saved. God will protect you if you continue, he says, in holiness and in sound. Actually, he's talking about being in your right mind. Mm -hmm. we, we often put kind of connotations of um, virtue and prudence on the descriptions of women. But actually, I think he's just talking about being sensible, sane, you know, holy, righteous, uh, full of faith. And then God will be with you through that process. So you don't need to go to Artemis and run to her for protection. That's what I think. It's something like that. Anyway. Yeah, I, I, it's fascinating. I felt, wow, it was compelling when I was reading it. I thought, wow, because it is a really strange. So strange. What does it mean to be saved through childbearing, which is so interesting because in 1 Corinthians 7, he's telling people not to get married as well and so you're like, he doesn't think that you have to have a baby to be saved so what could it mean so yes. yeah I really I appreciated I appreciated that no yeah. thank you um I I wanted to ask you James about because um you know my my PhD was on Christ in the spirit so um I I loved your emphasis on the humanity of Jesus yeah me too. and on him learning and I'm totally on board with that and the idea of Jesus actually or the son the divine son submitting himself to a human life you know and and living as a human on this earth and I I I think that's great but I was wondering about the role of the spirit in you know because I was reading and I was like oh but this but this spirit the holy spirit filled Jesus to full measure you know so you I know I you want to bring out the the you know the absolutely fully human nature of Jesus's life and I I believe that and I think that the writer of Hebrews tells us that you know that he's like us in every respect but but he, there are also some disanalogies between us and Jesus in terms of our humanity, because I, I think because of the way he was filled to the full measure with the spirit and that his wisdom and knowledge was also coming from the father in a way that is accessible to us also through the spirit but not quite in the same way so i just wondered you know obviously as a systematic theologian i'm interested in like dogmatic issues and i was kind of wondering i was thinking has the divine son kind of disappeared somewhere and how does he you know how do you fit that in to your scheme and as somebody who's working clearly in sort of New Testament historical Jesus focus, I was so glad that I had a good excuse methodologically yeah. to sidestep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I knew I was going to be talking about them in podcasts and in interviews and that people are going to constantly ask that. Uh, but on the one hand, it, the book would have had to be a lot longer, I think, and thicker in order to try to tackle those things. But I also was aware that on the one hand, having been fascinated with this question uh, from my undergrad days, looking at the different Christologies in, in church history, different theologians today, trying to figure out how to how to fit these things together, how to restate them so, so that they make sense in a, in a modern context, that I'm not sure anybody has a, a really great answer to, here's how, if, if you just fit things these things together in this way, uh, all, all the problems disappear and all your questions are resolved. You know? And so that was part of it that I wasn't sure I had something really satisfying to offer. Um, and so it was better to direct people, uh, people to people like you and say, you know, talk to a theologian to uh, take you on the next step of your exploration of this topic. Uh, but I was also aware just pragmatically that if, if I were to come down and say, well, you can, you can think of it in these terms, that there would be plenty of people who would say, 
oh, he thinks about Jesus that way in terms of his theology. Well, then let me ignore what he's saying about the, these texts in the Gospels and things like oh, okay. that. And so I just felt like I had lots of reasons to, to set those things aside. Uh, mm -hmm. But in a very real way, I'm not sure I have figured out uh, how to fit these things together uh, entirely. And mm -hmm. a lot of that, I think the main reason for that is that it, it really is a question about Jesus inner life, as it were, mm -hmm. right? Uh, whether we're thinking, you know, a divine inner life or a human inner life or a, a human slash divine inner life, uh, inner life. Uh, these are things which we only have, as it were, access to through sort of the gospel stories. And then if we go beyond that, uh, unless we're claiming to have you know, some special revelation, uh, we're really using our, our best human thinking to, to try to describe, explain, um, or even just point to and, sim and express in sim symbolic language uh, what we understood to be going on there. And so on the one hand, I said, let me stick with the, the gospels and uh, the gospels I think are very much you know, treating Jesus as human. Uh, everything else that they're saying, his humanity is, is simply a given, right? They're, they're early enough and close enough to Jesus' human life uh, lived in the presence of the people who are the sources for these gospels, whether directly or indirectly, that that was simply not uh, not deniable, I think. And so uh, I, I don't know if that's a very, uh, that's certainly not a satisfying answer in terms of, you know, you may, I, I'm not sure whether you're wondering, we're really wondering why did you not address this in the book or, well, oh, okay, I, but now what do you really think, James? <laughs> well, I just, I know, I think I was asking when, no, you did answer because what you're saying to me it was, it was a very conscious decision because I wanted to do exactly this and so that yeah I mean I just it was like Jamie's saying to me you know why did you write what you wrote and mm -hmm. and it's really interesting I think for people to hear oh this is why I wrote what I wrote and and isn't it interesting that there are so many different approaches to how we can write about Jesus and how we you know who, how we encounter him and why we decide to do what we do and um you had a really clear method that you were following and you know that's what it entailed so i think that's really interesting yeah i think the only thing i'd add i'd add is that i think that precisely because in as much as uh christians whatever their precise christology however they would formulate it precisely would say that they've had an encounter with God uh, that's mediated through the person of, of Christ, that it's, it's through this human life that is accessible to us that anything more that we want to say, uh, we, we might say, whether uh, saying it because we, we think we see it actually there in his life or because we think it's the implication of it as we work it through theologically in more detail, uh, and go beyond what the sources explicitly say. And yet, so often the, the, the more elaborate doctrines about the presence of God in Jesus have led people to say, well, you know, we can't talk about that, or we, we, will assume, we wouldn't assume he did that. You know, he wouldn't learn because God. Right. And uh, right. I really did, you know, it wasn't just a methodological thing uh, and <laughs> the convenience of being able to sidestep some very difficult questions. But I think that there's a, a sense in which I also have a conviction that this really is, if, if we're to get to anything more that we might want to say about Jesus, it has to be by way of the human life that the gospels talk about. And so then bringing in something else in order to deny some of the things that, for instance, Luke you know, says quite explicitly, um, is either putting the cart before the horse or, or maybe even, you know, allowing our, our theology to override the Gospels, which, at least in theory, Protestants ought not to do. And yet, of course, we know, we know from our experience that that's not always the case in practice. Yeah, and I... I, oh, okay. I yeah, go on. No, go ahead, Lucy. No, I was just going to say that is really interesting to me because that because my whole PhD thesis was exactly on that topic of how how can you give a dogmatic account of Jesus' 
life that sticks closely to the 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 biblical evidence that he was fully human so instead of the systematics you know the the fully divine and the fully human kind of obscuring the humanity i looked at people like john owen who said if you can't if you if your account of the fully human fully divine jesus doesn't give you the account of the full humanity then there's something wrong with your account mm -hmm. so so that's why I'm interested in in what you did. So I do I do think that there's there's some really good dogmatic reflection on the life of Jesus that is going on that isn't just oh abstract him out and make him into some kind of metaphysical you know archetype. Yeah. Anyway, Jamie. Yeah, this is this is the fun of having an interdisciplinary conversation because there's already similarity and difference even if you're talking like with two new testament scholars or i would imagine two systematicians but this is just interesting how we even approach or conceptualize a project and the data in front of us and kind of our passion you know and our vocation again uh, in the way it's fantastic to have people with different lenses different vocations come at the question to kind of fill it out. So I'm a, in my regular life, um, I'm a John scholar. And, you know, of course, when you're, when I hear you all talking about this, I go right to first John, right? Because this is exactly what happens. People read the gospel of John and then a later stage, boom, docetism, yeah. right? So, you know, and first John says, look, anybody who does not believe that Jesus came in the flesh is antichrist. Um, like, wow, okay, that's uh, escalated pretty quickly. Uh, but the author already in the first century had the experience of people going on this flight of fancy, which done differently, not the way you're talking about, Lucy, has clearly had that exact effect. And it also allows, I think, people a cop out. Because if Jesus was divine, and he was extra, in so many ways, then you know what? good for him that he did this and went above and beyond. It, it can be, it's not supposed to be, but it can be seen as less of a requirement or a conviction on my part that he managed this as a human being walking around with 24 hours in a day, a body that sometimes worked well and maybe sometimes didn't. And even in that capacity, he still managed to convey and spread the love of God, the liberation of God. And so there's really no excuse uh, for you not to be doing that because he managed that even as a human being. Look what he did. So what are we waiting for? So, so it can go either way. But I love the fact that the conversation you all are having is already manifested within scripture that this is a tendency of some people um, to get kind of out of this world or kind of like, well, yay for Jesus, but what does it have to do with me? Because I'm not um, special that way. So um, so it's the whole conversation is just really instructive, I think, you know. I did, before we finish, I did, Jamie, want to ask you to say something about, the, because I loved your piece on God as the potter mm. and God as the wailing woman, the mourner. And I, I really, that really, really spoke to me. So I would love you just to say something about that. Yeah. So again, like you, I had the privilege of spending time drawing upon the work of many other biblical scholars, especially in Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, because I don't normally hang out in that world as a, as a scholar. And so drawing on work of um, especially uh, Hebrew Bible, Old Testament scholars, that was new to me. I did not know. So I look, cause I always use that image of God as potter. And one of my favorite verses is always, we have this treasure in clay jars. It's just a daily kind of verse that I live with. Um, and I had no idea until I did this research that that image of God as potter is a feminine image because pottery was actually done in antiquity by women, which the more I read about you know, ancient economy and households make sense because those are the people who are, they live on compounds and they're the women working together and build, um, you know, making things to store food in. They were also the first beer makers, which makes sense because I guess beer and bread are related. Um, so learning, this is where, again, giving people history doesn't have to be boring. It can actually be really insightful and change even our knowledge about our metaphors that we use. So yeah, to find out that, that, that potters were women and then think of God's hands shaping our lives and our, ourselves. Uh, it's just 
extra tender to me, I think, um, uh, was really, really beautiful. And then the whole piece on mourner, um, women as mourners, professional mourners in antiquity, even in our own period in the New Testament, you see it in, in this Lazarus story in John 11. So people whose actual job in the community is to testify to the pain and suffering of the community in a formal way, uh, publicly. So that as an actual job, a paid job, um, that was the role of women. Keeners, they call them, K-E-E-N-E-R-S, the ones who keen or wail. And then to learn, yeah, by studying Jeremiah and these other texts and reading Carol Myers and people who tell us about antiquity, that, um, and to show God as that, God weeps. You know, I have um, over here in my china cabinet that you can't see, you know, I have a tear jar from Bethlehem in there. And I have never noticed the Psalm where David says, you, you know, hold our tears, that God has a tear bottle and that God mourns and cries. And to know that that's, um, you know, obviously ancient views of masculinity had to do with, you know, men don't cry, probably modern views too. Um, so, so for the text to intentionally depict God in that kind of feminized form, um, I just thought was really, really beautiful. And, you know, at first, cause like you all, I tried all of this stuff out on real Christian congregations, um, at clergy, laity. And at, at first I named that chapter, God as a woman in the Bible. And I was with some Texas female Methodist clergy and they were like, no, because that again is getting into, I don't know, it's limiting God in a way. So they helped me come up with the, the notion of God across gender, because I don't, none of us, none of the three of us is the kind of person who likes to promote women at the expense of men, right? To score points that somehow women are better than now that we flip the narrative or something and women are all that. And somehow that means a kind of demotion or derogation of men. And it's like that, that zero sum game is useless and injurious. Uh, it doesn't help anybody. So I love this language of God across gender or Jesus across gender, because they're this and this and this and this, all of these metaphors, all the genders, all the diversity of creation is a reflection of God. And it's not in any way, shape or form a demotion of anyone else. So, um, so I was really thankful for all the people who listened to these talks and helped shape them into something more useful and true. That's brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. And that might be a good note to end on just because we started with Jesus, but we're ending with like creation and the nature of God, which is a, a sort of a nice place to come come to and find that you can you can start with Jesus and end up there, I think is is nice and nicely symbolic, I think. Uh, yeah. but of course we have you know, things said about Jesus as, you know, the last Adam, which, you know, and, mm -hmm. about, you know, there being neither male nor female in Christ. And, you know, that take us straight back to Genesis and the idea that, you know, male and female reflect the image of God. And so these, these female images of God in scripture should not surprise us if we've been paying attention from literally page one. Right. Um, Bible's <laughs> pages. If it's a scroll, then obviously it's, you know. <laughs> Right. So, well, thank you for the conversation. I just, I loved reading your books. I love that they were really different from mine in certain ways, but then like you said, certain fundamental convictions uh, of faith, um, really instructive and very exciting. So thank you for your work. And you. Thank you so uh, much. Yeah. And thank you both. Uh, let me put the pictures of the books back up on the screen just one last time. And Add that you know I highly recommend them, but for for anyone who's not yet uh, fully persuaded that uh, that women played an active role in the early church and uh, are viewed positively in the Bible and are are not quite there yet, then don't start with my book. Right, uh, read Lucy's and Jamie's um, and go, get there first. I think they'll give you a better introduction. Um, yeah, mine kind of throws you in at the deep end. I think with regard to that, in some ways. <laughs> Well, um, thank you for hosting us again, James. This yeah, is really you. wonderful. It's been oh, great. Not at all. I've been, I, this was delightful. And I know we still have things we could have talked about. And so uh, hopefully, even if not in this format right now, uh, right. I hope we'll stay in touch and continue those conversations. And I hope that people enjoyed uh, the opportunity to listen in on our conversation. Thanks, James. <laughs>